to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 10. We're continuing, of course, our study of the book of Acts. We're seeing the, the history, basically, of the church in the first century, about the first 30 years. There's so much. In fact, think about this. Here's what we've seen as we've been going through this. We've seen the message begin in Jerusalem and spread north to Samaria, and then now south to Judea, even all the way to Gaza. And the message is going from the Jews to the Samaritans, and even this morning, we're going to see it going to the Gentiles. This morning, we're going to see this man named Cornelius. He's a Roman soldier. And Peter takes the message to him. In fact, takes it to his whole family. When we say Gentiles, most of us probably in this room are Gentiles. And so we think the message of salvation go to Gentiles. We think, well, that's no big deal. I mean, because that's the way it is. But you've got to remember at the beginning of the church, the church was almost all Jewish. And the Jewish people and the Gentiles, there was, there was a, a barrier there. It started with the law, but it was just a barrier. Let me raise some questions because when you think uh, about this passage, let, let me raise some questions. What kind of man was this Cornelius? And how was he devout? Because it calls him a devout man. And then how did God communicate both to Peter and to Cornelius? And then how did Jews feel about Gentiles? I mean, I think there's a lot in this passage. Now, I'm going to be really open at uh, what I'm going to talk about for a second. My junior year in high school, there was a change. I grew up up in Meridian, Mississippi. And in that time, in my junior year, there was integration. See, at that time, there had been a white school and a black school. And they decided, which was the right thing to do, to bring them all together. And nobody knew what was going to happen, especially in Mississippi. But you know what? It was great, actually. And uh, both groups, when they came together, didn't know what each other was like but then began to be friends. That summer, something happened to me. I always wanted to be a coach, and so that summer, going into my senior year of high school, I ran the off-season program for my high school because I wanted to be a coach, and Coach Tyler said, you run the whole thing, and I'd get there real early in the morning and uh, train guys all, all day long. I thought that was fantastic. I worked from 6 in the morning to 8 at night, and I got $10 a day, and I thought that was a lot of money. I was going, this is fantastic. I, I love it. I mean, 50 bucks a week, you know? <laughs> A guy came out, his name was Robert Bell, and he was Afro-American, he's a black guy. First one to ever come out at any sport in Meridian High School. And I got to train him. And I didn't know what to think about Robert, and he Robert didn't know what to think about me. And we became friends. And all summer we trained together. And he was the first Afro-American person to play for Meridian High School. He was the first black athlete to be all state in Mississippi. He was the first black athlete to sign a scholarship with Mississippi State and the first black athlete to sign a scholarship with any Southeastern Conference school. And he was the first all Southeastern Conference black athlete ever. I love Robert Bell, he's my friend. And when we first Robert first came, we didn't know what to think about each other. We knew it'd be different in the first century. When these Jewish people are going to these Gentiles, they don't know what to think about Gentiles. And Gentiles don't know what to think about Jews. And in the first century, Jewish people looked at Gentiles this way. They said they're not God's chosen people, and they don't have the Bible, and they don't have the law, and they were considered unclean because they ate different foods that the Jewish people wouldn't eat. And so Jewish people said, you eat those food, we, we, don't, we don't mess with you. This morning, God is preparing Peter to take the message to the Gentiles. If you remember at the end of chapter 9, God is already getting Peter ready. If you look at the end of chapter 9, look at verse 43. And Peter stayed many days in Joppa with a tanner named Simon. You say, so what? For the Jewish people, any Jewish person that was a tanner, that was called an unclean occupation because you had to kill these animals. And some of those animals were pigs. And so they didn't have anything. So tanners usually lived outside the city, usually lived by the water. It smelled really bad. And that was an unclean occupation. But Peter is staying with Simon the tanner, which uh, you could say to Peter, Peter, you, you, you staying with that guy? Yeah, I'm staying with that guy. God is about to send him to Cornelius, a Gentile. 
Let me break down this passage for you. We're just going to, this morning we're going to see in verses 1 through 8, Cornelius gets a vision. He's a centurion. He gets this vision to send for Peter. Then we see Peter gets a vision. He's on top of the roof, and he sees this thing about what he thought was unclean is now clean. And we'll talk about that. And then as we look a little further, these visitors arrive and tell him, you're supposed to go back and go to Cornelius' house. And so he goes, and Peter meets Cornelius. And we're going to stop at verse 27 this morning where they meet the family. And then we're going to see what happens, and we'll see it next time, the exact message that Peter gave. As we begin, let's remember that things are already changing. The Jewish people have already gone to the Samaritans, half Jew, half Gentile, and they've trusted in Christ. They've seen a man from Ethiopia come to know Christ. Remember when uh, Stephen, Philip was down there and he saw the Ethiopian come to know Christ? And now they're going to a Gentile. Here's a question. How are the Gentiles saved? Guess what? Saved just like everybody else. Saved simply by faith in Jesus Christ. The truth of salvation is always by faith, as whether it was a Jew or a Gentile, or whether it was a Samaritan, regardless of what race, what part of a nation, regardless of anything. Salvation is always one way, and that is by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. He is the Savior. Well, let's see what happens. Let me show you, show you where we are on the map. Jerusalem, you see down at the bottom. Peter is in this town called Joppa. You remember he had been at Lydda, and, and we talked about the, the little lady that had died, and Peter raised her from the dead, so he's at Joppa. There's a city right up the coast, if you see it, called Caesarea. Sometimes it's called Caesarea by the sea. It was a Roman city. We're going to talk more about it in just a minute. Peter is in Joppa. Cornelius is in Caesarea. And Cornelius sends to Joppa to get Peter. And Peter goes. And we're going to see what happens. Let's look. First of all, there's two visions in the passage. The first one is Cornelius' vision. Look what happens. Acts chapter 10, look at verse 1. There was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort. Now, we're going to see the message has gone from to the Jew, to the Samaritan, and now to the Gentile. There's a certain man named Cornelius. He's in the city of Caesarea. Cornelius was a centurion. Now, a centurion was a Roman soldier, and he controlled a hundred men. Centurion. Now, of the centurions, that there was usually six centurions came together to make a cohort, and then that, that'd be 600 men, and then 10 of those came together to make a legion, 6,000 men. Now, centurions were the backbone of the Roman army. They were the men with character. They were the men that could be depended. They had 100 men under them, and when you wanted something done, you went to a centurion. Every time we see a centurion in the Scripture, they are men of character. And so here's one. There's this man there from, uh, from at the city of Caesarea. His name is Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort. Now, the normal Jewish people, they don't like Romans at all. They don't like the Roman army at all because the army has come in, has taken over, has ruled them. There's been some bad things happen. And so Jewish people don't really like the Romans, and they especially don't like the soldiers. This man's a soldier. Now, he's in the city called Caesarea. It's the Roman headquarters in Israel. You think Jerusalem's the headquarters. It is not the headquarters. The Romans' headquarters in Caesarea. It's named for Caesar, Caesar Augustus. It was built by Herod the Great. They have a big stadium there that held 30,000 people. That was big in those days. Uh, Roman garrison was there. And so here's this man living in a Roman city, and look what happens. How, look how he is described. He was a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. What? What are we? This is a Roman soldier, and yet it calls him a devout man. Now, the word devout means religious. He's a religious man, and it goes on to say that he was a, a, one who feared God with all his household. God, literally, a God-fearer. Now, let's talk about that. You know what a God-fearer was? A God-fearer was a Gentile who said, I believe in the God of Israel, and so I'm going to become like a Jew. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come under the laws. I'm going to try to do good for the Jewish people. He's called a God-fearer. So this, then this man's not a Christian. He's not a believer in Jesus Christ. He's a believer in Judaism. He says, I like the laws. I like those kind of things. I like the Jewish people. And it said that he gave all, many alms to the Jewish people. He prayed continually to God. He was one that feared God with his household. He did these two things. Look, notice the name. He gave and he prayed. He gave much to the Jewish people. At the time of Jesus, there were some, there were some Romans like that. There were, remember, they, some people came to, the, uh, some of the guys came to, to Jesus one time and said, there's this man who's a Roman, and he's given so much to the Jewish people, you need to come help him. So sometimes there were Romans who helped the Jewish people. 
I want you to understand something. He was, he was a religious man, but he was not saved. He's not a Christian. He was doing a lot of good things. He gave money for the synagogue, most likely. He gave money to Jewish people. It says that he gave many alms and prayed to God continually. I've talked to people and say, uh, if you were to die, will you go to heaven? Yes. Why? Because I pray to God. Praying to God doesn't save you. This man is not a believer. There are people in this town, in our city, that are very religious, and they go to church every Sunday, and they have never trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Salvation is not by what you do, or give money, or go to church, or be religious, or keep the rules of the law. That's not salvation. Salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ. So here's a man who's done a lot of good things, especially to Jewish people, and yet he's not a believer. See, religion, next slide, Religion is man trying to please God. That's works. Christianity is God pleasing God. God so loved the world that he gave his son. It's faith. So there's a big difference. The world is full of religion. People trying to do something to get to God. When Christianity, true Christianity, is God doing it all. He sent his son. He died on the cross. He paid for sin. He rose again. He offers to us the gift of eternal life by faith. Well, what happens? Look at verse 3. About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius. Now, let's talk about it. The ninth hour of the day is, is 3 o'clock in the afternoon. That's how they did it. They had a, if you were like Cornelius and you were into Judaism, there was, there was 9 o'clock in the morning that you prayed, and there was 3 o'clock in the afternoon that you prayed. That was the time of the sacrifices. Now, this man lives in Caesarea. He doesn't live in Jerusalem, so he, he doesn't have anything to do with the temple area, but he knows when the offerings were. So it says that about the ninth hour of the day, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he saw in a vision an angel angel of God who had just come into him and calls him by name. He says, Cornelius. Of course, in fixing his eyes on him and being much alarmed, he said, what is it, Lord? Now, the word Lord there, he's not saying, I think you're God. It's the word that means sir. It really has the idea of saying, uh, who are you and, and, and what, what is it? What do you want? And look what the angel said. Your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now, he's afraid. Notice it. He, he was much afraid, and he said, what is it? And he said, your prayers and your alms have gone up as a memorial before God. He says, when you're praying to God and when you're giving, God has remembered that. See, what he's actually doing is reaching out to God without knowing, without knowing the way to get to God. He's saying, I think if you do good, if you try to give money, if you try to do this, oh God, I want to reach you, so I'm going to give money. Oh God, I'm going to do this. I, I'm going to do this for you. And the angel says, listen, your prayers and your alms have come up as a memorial to God. God is about to respond to this man's reaching out to him. Now, I remember about 10 years ago, there was a person who was a prominent Christian leader in the United States, publicly declared, God does not hear the prayer of unbelievers. That's what he said. That's wrong. Can unbelievers pray to God? Yes. Does God hear their prayers? Yes. Do we see that this man's praying to God? Yes. Has God heard his prayers? Yes. Now, God's not an obligation to do anything because God is God. But God, God doesn't say, oh, if you're not a believer, I don't even listen to you. No. We have a great God, a God who loves every person, a God who created every person. So look what happens. Fixing his gaze on him, it, this is verse 4 again, and much alarm, he said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God, and here's what I want you to do. Now send some men, dispatch some men to Joppa, and send, a man, and send for a man named Simon, he's also called Peter. He's staying with a tanner who's named Simon, whose house is by the sea. Now notice how specific he says. I want you to go to Joppa. There's a guy named Simon there. Now his name is Simon Peter because there's another Simon there. He's in a guy's house named Simon. His name's Simon, but his Simon Peter. The house is by the sea. The guy's a tanner. Is that pretty specific? He's saying, I want you to go find this guy. Send for him. 
he is staying with a tanner named Simon whose house is by the sea. Now, why did he want Peter to come? I want to read something to you because this is a little bit further on. But when they reported what happened, here's what they said. He said, send to Joppa. This is Acts 11. We're going to get this later. Acts 11, he said, send to Joppa and have Simon, who's called Peter, brought here. He shall speak to you the words by which you will be saved. Peter is going to give him the message how to be saved. Now, he's a religious man. He's doing good deeds. He's giving money, but he's not saved. He says, you send to Joppa to a man named Simon Peter, who's staying with a guy named Simon, who's a tanner, houses by the sea. He's going to tell you how you can be saved. He's going to tell you how you can have life. This man was a devout religious man, but he's not saved. Salvation is not being, by being religious. Salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ. Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saves us. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you are saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So look what happened. When the angel who was speaking to him had left, he summoned two of his servants and a devout soldier of those who were his personal attendants. And after he explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. He calls in two of his slaves and one of his soldiers who is like a personal attendant. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to the place called Joppa. It's about 28 miles away. I want you to get there. I want you to find a guy named Simon Peter. He's at the house of a guy named Simon who's a tanner out by the sea. I want you to get there. Tell him that I saw an angel. An angel told me to send for him so he could come and tell us the message. That's what he told these guys. He said, and explained to them everything that happened and sent them to Joppa. Well, that's pretty good. But what about Peter? Now, if you're Peter, and you're a normal Jew, and even though you're a Christian, and you said, I want you to go to the Gentiles, they'd say, uh, we, don't, we don't really have much to do with Gentiles. Thanks for asking. But we don't. We don't have much to do with them. So how's God going to get Peter ready? Because Peter spent his whole life believing that Gentiles are unclean and that you don't have much to do with them. The second vision is Peter's. Watch what happens. Verse 9. On the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. Now, the next day, Peter's been staying with Simon the Tanner. Now, most houses in that day, they had a regular little house and room, and then normally there was some steps that are like a ladder or some steps that would go up the side of the house, and you could actually stay on top of the house. Usually in the evening, that was the coolest part of the day. Sometimes they even slept on top of their houses because that was the coolest time, the coolest place. So he goes up there about the sixth hour, that's 12 o'clock, and he goes up there to pray and, and, and watch. But he became hungry and was desiring to eat, but while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. Now, he goes up there, he basically says, y'all call me when the food's ready, okay? I'm going to go up on top of the thing. And so he's up there waiting, and he said, man, I'm sure hungry. I'll be glad when they get the food fixed. And about that time, he fell into a trance. Watch this. God is preparing Peter to go to the Gentiles. Watch what happens. He saw the sky open and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by the four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. Now, while he's waiting, he falls into this trance, and all of a sudden, out of the sky, it comes like a big sheet coming down, four corners coming down. Just picture a big sheet coming down with the four corners being held up, and there's something in that sheet. And as it gets down where he can see it, he looks in there, and there are all these animals in there. And notice it described as four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. Now let me tell you, in that sheet are a whole bunch of animals that under Jewish law you would never eat. You remember under Jewish law, if you go back to Deuteronomy and, and, and Exodus and Leviticus, there are all kind of foods that say you may eat these foods, you may not eat these foods. He looked in that sheet and all these animals are crawling around him, and he looks in there and goes, those are unclean animals. You can't eat those. You, you're not supposed to eat those. I'm Jewish. We never eat those. That's what he would say. Notice that all that happened and a voice came to him saying, it said this, get up, Peter, kill and eat. What? Get up, 
kill and eat. Basically, a voice, and he knows it's from God, is saying, you eat those animals. So what does Peter say? But Peter said, by no means, Lord, I have never eaten anything holy and unclean. I, I'm, not, I'm not supposed to eat those animals. I, I would never do this. Again, a voice came to him a second time and said, what God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. This happened three times, and immediately the object was taken up in the sky. So you can see Peter there, and the voice saying, kill and eat, and he goes, I don't eat that. He says, what I've called clean, you eat. But I don't eat that. What I've called clean, you eat. I don't eat that. You, I've called three times, and then it goes back up. Now he's in a trance. What do you think this dream means? Anyway, we look at this. And, and it says, a voice came to him that second time, what God has cleansed no longer considered unholy. This happened three times, and then the object was taken back up in the sky. Three times. Now, what's this vision about? First of all, I want you to understand, this is dealing with more than animals. See, in Peter's mind, you can't eat any of those kind of animals because that's under the Jewish law. But what Peter's forgotten, if you go back to Mark chapter 7, Jesus said, it's not what goes in your mouth that defiles you. It's what come out of your mouth that defiles you. He said to eat different foods doesn't make you unclean. And so it says Jesus already declared all food clean. What's he talking about? He's talking about people. He's saying Peter and many other Jewish believers are going to have to overcome this old view if they're going to reach all men with the good news because what have they considered the Gentiles? They've considered them what? Unclean. And all of a sudden, God's saying, get that. You can do that. And Peter's saying, what? but I have never done that before. I've never done this before. We must look at all people, no matter where they live, no matter what they're like, we must look as all people who need Jesus Christ. And all people, we should take the message to everyone that we can. Listen, I, I got an I got a email and then a phone call in the last two weeks from some people in India. And they're a church in India. And they're asking us as a church, now we're looking at it, we're looking at it, our missions committee is going to meet about it. But they're wanting to know if we would, they've got 27 pastors. They sent me pictures, everything. They have 27 pastors that go into the tribal areas, which are areas that have no cars, no roads or anything. And they're trying to get out there. And they've written me and wondered, would we help them get bicycles to send the pastors into the tribal area? You could say, I don't know, India, India? I don't want to talk with India. You don't? What about Africa? What about Central Europe? What about Asia? What about the Middle East? What about Saudi Arabia? What about Iran? What about Afghanistan? We want to go to any of those people with the message of Jesus Christ? Peter is, is having to go, what is this dream all about? Watch what happens. Verse 17, now while Peter was greatly perplexed in his mind to what he had visioned, which he had seen might be, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions to Simon's house, appeared to the gate. You can see they came into the town, and they said, we're supposed to go. We're looking for a guy named Simon who's a tanner. They said, out by the sea. He's, his house is over there. They got to the gate, and they said, hey, is there a person named Simon Peter at this house? They called out and were asking whether Simon, who was called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was reflecting on the vision, notice the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit. The Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, accompany them without any misgivings for I have sent them myself. Now, while he's thinking about this vision, he's trying to figure out, does it talk about animals? Is it talking about people? What's it talking about? He said, I've sent three men. They're looking for you. I want you to go accompany them. I've sent them. God wanted Peter to know this was from him. This is from him. He's getting Peter to take the big step. And this is a big step in the history of the church. And if you're a Gentile, you better be thankful that the step was made. Yes. 
Because this message is now beginning to go out, and it's going to go out to Gentiles, and it's going to start spreading. And Paul the Apostle, who's now going to be called the Apostle to the Gentiles, he's going to start going all over um, Asia Minor, and into Europe, and into Greece, and in all Athens, and Rome, and he's going to take the message. Spain, he's going to begin to take the message throughout the world. So we'll look what happened. He said, go downstairs, go with them, don't worry about it. I've sent them. So Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I'm the one you're looking for. What's the reason for which you've come? Why did you come? And here's what they said. They said, Cornelius the centurion, he's a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews. They wanted to make it clear. This man is well spoken of by the Jews. You think those three men who came are Jews? They're not Jews. They're Gentiles. Two of them are servants of Cornelius. The other's a Roman soldier. And they come and they say, Our friend, our man named Cornelius has sent us. He's a God-fearing man. And all of the Jews where we live think he's great. He was directed, divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear a message from you. You supposed to come tell a message? What is the message? What do you think the message is? Uh, y'all shouldn't be eating those food. Do you think that's the message? The message is about Jesus. The message is our message. The exact same message that Peter took is the same message that we take into our community and our world. And that is Jesus is the Savior. He's the way, the truth, and the life. It is the message that by faith in him you have eternal life. What did Peter do? Look what he did. So he invited them in and gave them lodging. What? You understand what just happened? He took three Gentiles and asked them to stay with him in his house. That's pretty way out there already. I think Peter is saying, I think I'm beginning to put this together. I'm beginning to think that maybe it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Samaritan or a Gentile. It, it, maybe it doesn't matter what your background is. Maybe it doesn't matter what food you eat. Maybe it doesn't matter what you look like. Maybe everybody is supposed to hear this message. So he invited them in and gave them lunch. And on the next day he got up and went away with them. And some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Now, I want you to understand something. Some of the brethren went with him. He took some Jewish people with him. He took six other Jewish people with him. Acts chapter 11, verse 12 says, The Spirit told me to go, and six brethren went with me. Listen, he wasn't going by himself. He said, if I'm going to go to the home of the Gentiles, to this man named Cornelius Soldier, I'm going to take six Jewish guys with me so they can see what God's doing, that this is not just something I came up with. This is what God wants us to do. And so he gets these guys, and they leave. And notice what it says, accompanied. On that day, they're accompanied by uh, brethren from Joppa accompanying him. Watch what happens. He's going to take the greatest message of all time to all people. Is there somebody in your life that you said, I'm not talking to them about Jesus because I don't like them. I don't like the way they look. They're different to me. I don't like people in Afghanistan. I don't like people in Iran. They're gonna, they're gonna get a nuclear weapon and blow everybody up so we don't, we don't care anything about them. And say, Saudi Arabia, they try to be our friends on one side, but they're not our friends, so I don't like them. We don't want them to know. Do we? What do you think Cornelius is doing? He's calling everybody together. He said, listen, a guy's coming, and a guy's coming to give us the greatest message of all time because this man's coming to tell us how we can be saved. So I want all my friends. I want all my relatives. Everybody get in the house. I'll be waiting out front. I'll tell you when this guy comes, and we'll bring him in. On the following day, he entered Caesarea. Now, Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. Think about this. He was excited. He was excited about the Word of God. He was excited to hear, what is Peter going to tell me? I think up to this point, I've done everything. I thought. I have, uh, I've given money. I've, 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 I've tried to worship. God. I pray continually. What else can I do? I'm anxious to hear what this guy has for me to do. Have you ever talked to somebody and they said something like, if God would just tell me what he wants me to do, I'll be glad to do it. It's not what we do, is it? It's what we believe. 
So he's got all his friends there. Second, he wanted, he wanted others to know. Notice what it says. He had his relatives and close friends. He's got them all there to hear the message. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. When he comes in, uh, this is not in the room. This is in, but they come into the town and then they come into his house. And no, normally, Cornelius, as a centurion, was wealthier than most people. And so he had a house. And usually, uh, Simon the Tanner, obviously, we can't tell much about this, but in the Cornelius Roman houses, there was a house and then it was usually a wall around the house and a front gate. Most likely, Cornelius is by the front gate. And when Peter shows up, and of course, Cornelius sees his three friends that he sent, his two, two servants and the soldier, and Peter comes and a whole bunch of guys with Peter. I mean, there's like 10 people coming. He says, this must be the man. And when Peter comes up, look what he does. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him. He said, I'm Simon Peter, uh, you wanted to talk to me? And he fell at his feet and worshipped him. He fell at his feet and worshipped him. What is Peter going to do? Uh, excuse me. <laughs> I'm not to be worshipped. Watch. But Peter raised him up saying, stand up. I'm just a man. I'm just a man. I want you to understand something. It's not the messenger, and it's not the method that you use. It's the message. See, I want you to understand something. It's not the messenger. That's us. It's not the method that you use. I'm going to use the bad news, good news. I'm going to use John 3.16. I'm going to use the bridge. I'm going to use the gospel of John. I'm going to do all this. Listen, it's not that. It's the message. See, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes to the who? Jew first and also to the Gentile, to the Greek. That's it. See, when we go out these doors, it's not you, and it's not even your method. It's your message, and your message is about Jesus. He died and rose again, and he gives eternal life to all who believe, and so that's our message. So it doesn't matter who you are, and it doesn't even matter your method as long as you're clear. It's the message that gives eternal life when they believe in Jesus. So look what happened. So Peter said, stand up, I, I, I'm just a man. And as he talked with him, he entered and found many people assembled. How would you feel if you were Peter, and this is the first time most likely in your life that you ever went into the home of a Gentile? And it wasn't just one Gentile, a whole room full of people all waiting to hear what you got to say. What is Peter going to tell them. Well, you just have to read the verses ahead to, to, to find out before next time to see what does he tell them in this amazing message. We have seen a religious man named Cornelius gets a message from God, send for Peter, he will tell you the way of salvation. We see Peter gets a vision from God that, that all these things which he thought were unclean, they're not unclean. In fact, nothing's unclean. We're going to see that Peter wakes up and basically says, I just realized that God doesn't show partiality to anyone. Romans 2.11, there is no partiality with God. Peter comes to the home of the Gentile with six Jewish men with him ready to give the message. So let's look at some applications. First one is this. Remember, salvation is based on our relationship with Christ and not religion. It's, a relationship comes by faith. Cornelius was a religious man. He did prayers, alms, doing good. He was not saved. He was responding to God. He was saying, I want to know the true God. And so God sent the word to him. Salvation is not our actions. It is Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Religion is man trying to please God. That's works. Christianity is God pleasing God. God loved world. God gave his son. We come by faith. There are people in our town who you come in contact with daily that believe that going to heaven, being with God, is based on their goodness, is based on their actions, based on their religion, based on things that they try to do so that God will be pleased with them. They need to understand it's not their works, it's faith alone. In Christ alone. Second, let's share the salvation message with others. Look at this. A. The message is, is for our world. It's for every person. 
We want all people to know. Matthew 28, make disciples of every nation, every person. B, be clear on the good news. Jesus, 1 Corinthians 15, I deliver to you a first importance which I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture that he was buried and rose again on the third day according to the scripture. The good news is the death and resurrection of Christ. Romans 1 16. We're not ashamed of that message. It's the message that brings salvation. Be clear on that message. When you go out these doors be clear that you tell people Jesus died and rose again and it's faith in him that gives you eternal life. The third thing is this. God can use any of us. God can use any of us. Remember it's not the method or the messenger. It's the message. You can have a person that is handsome, sharp, brilliant, can speak well, and they give an unclear message, and the truth is not there. And you can have a person that stutters and looks all funny to us, and they go out there and they give the gospel, and a person trusts Christ. See, it's not the person. It's not the method. It's the message of Jesus Christ. May we clearly proclaim the good news message to all people.